We don't remember what someone said to us. We remember how they made us feel. We're not really listening. We're just waiting for people to screw up and then attacking them. All we have to do is listen. And one of the questions that this raises is like, what is the goal of a conversation? You've also written probably one of the most prominent and prolific books on habits. How do you make a habit and make it effective? The thing to understand is that every habit has these three components. If you can't make habits, you can't evolve. How can we as women make our husbands communicate more effectively? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'll tell you what's happened in my marriage, Give okay? Us all the juice. Careful, Charles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>so excited for this episode because I love episodes like this because I can slightly manipulate my husband into getting what I want. <laughs> That's every episode. So I, we have done close to 700 interviews. Oh my gosh. And well, I don't say that to brag. I say that just to, to give you an idea of the amount. And it is very rare that I fanboy over anyone. True. I, I, I mean this. And the people I find myself fanboying the most over are authors and when I got your email, I had to do a double take because I was like, no, like, not Charles. Like, and because I, you know, I've read The Power Have and I read Smarter Better, like all your, right now, you know, super communicators. Oh, thank you. Of course. That is so nice of you to say. No, but I mean it. And, and you know, I've, we've, I've had the pleasure of having a few authors that I admire so much, like yourself. And it's always these weird, surreal moments because I feel like with authors and people who write stuff, you know, you can see an actor or a podcast, somebody on screen, but with, with, with a writer, like... I have been in your head. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, abs I feel the same way about other writers, right? Uh -huh. And 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 actually podcasts too. I will say, you, you know, like when I listen to your guys' podcasts, there's something about someone being in your ear mm -hmm. that you just feel a relationship, yeah. right? And it feels magical. It feels it feels great. Yeah. I was saying I did this book or this podcast the other day about like reading more and the, and the importance of it. And I said, it's one of the rare times you can get outside of your own head. Absolutely. And like, if you're going through a tough time or just anything, it's like, it's really hard to get outside of yourself. And with an, when you're reading someone's work, it's like, it's a rare moment when you're not thinking as yourself. You're thinking like you are, but you're thinking as you as well. Absolutely. And you feel like you're learning something, which, oh, which, sure. and it's the best form of learning, right? Cause you're learning through stories. You're learning through like, uh, like someone else telling you about their life and it just feels good. And, and I think our brains actually have evolved to, to crave that. Have you always been a curious person? That is a great question. I, I'd have to ask my mom. <laughs> she would probably say yes. I think she would say nosy is the way that she would describe it. But yeah, I think that, I think that when I was young and, and I'm curious if what it was like for you guys and how you, how you think about raising your kids in this respect, that when I was young, I spent a lot of time wanting to understand how the world worked. And in part because like, I remember like as a kid, like, and, and I don't know if you guys had this experience of like picking up a book and just being like, if I can find the right book that tells me all the things I need to know, like I'm having trouble making friends at school or I'm having trouble, you know, talking to girls, like if I can just find the right book. And the thing that you realize, which is, I think a good, it's a part of growing up is that there is no book that tells you everything you need to know that actually books tell you a lot and then you have to go out in the world and you have to use it. Um, but I think I've always wanted to, I think I've always wanted to learn and I just, I enjoy learning, which I assume you guys do too. It, it, the show is such an obvious example of that, that wanting to learn about how people see the world is just fascinating. Yeah. I think, you know, your book, and I'm sure a lot of podcasts are saying this to you is so relevant to not not just everything going on in the world, but to specifically what we're trying to do here, which is Lauren and I have so many different characters with so many different backgrounds and so many different walks of life and so many different perspectives on the show. And I think what we're trying to do constantly is get to the root of why people think the way they do, yeah. but like how they came to their conclusions, getting into the difficult nitty gritty types of conversations that maybe people shy away from so that we can understand why deploy empathy. And I always say like the easiest thing to do from a content creation perspective is to pick one base and just like dive into that and just like hit all that stuff on the nose. But really, I think what we try to do here is like, why does this person think one way that we may not agree with? And how did they come to that conclusion? And it requires like a lot of listening and communication. Absolutely. And, and by the way, this is the thing that makes like a stronger as people. This is the thing that has made America such a strong nation and, and other nations so strong is this ability to have conversations with people, even if there's things we disagree with them. It, what's interesting is communication is homo sapiens superpower, right? It is the reason why 
we have succeeded where every other, more than other, every other species, it is how we build families and communities and villages and towns. It's how I can learn something and I can share it with you without you having to experience that same thing, that same learning yourself. And so our brains have evolved to be really good at communication. In fact, our brains have evolved to be fantastic communication machines. And so as a result, we can communicate with anyone. When we look back on the times in our own lives that we're most proud of, or we look at the founding of America, or we look at those moments in history that, that seem inspiring, it's usually not because everyone agreed with each other. It's because people who disagreed with each other were able to come together and create something. I mean, that's kind of what a marriage is, right? That there's times that you agree with each other and times you disagree with each other, but you know how to live with each other and you know how to love each other despite those differences. And most importantly, to communicate with each other. That's what makes a marriage really special. What do you think is the biggest breakdown in communication in this moment? Well, I'm kind of curious how you guys would answer that question too. I think one of the things that I would say is, so we used to teach communication in school. So we're the funny thing is we're do living, they not do it anymore. Not really. Interesting. Not really. We're, we're living through this golden age of understanding communication because of advances in neural imaging and data collection. We know more about communication now than we've ever known before, but a lot of that is happening in laboratories and not getting shared with people. So when your parents were in school and my parents were in school, they probably had a course like a home ec course or a interpersonal relations course. And in that course, and for me, it was health and we never really got into it, but in that course, they would learn how to communicate. They would practice communication. They would learn these tools, these tools that super communicators know in order to be able to connect with other people. And as schools got more, more technical, we stopped teaching a lot of that. And I think we're seeing the consequence right now. We're seeing what happens. You know, we're living through a time when it, People do feel divided from each other. When, if I have one difference with you, right? If we, we're going to vote for different people, it's like impossible for us to have a conversation. Where, whereas this is the smallest difference on the face of the planet, right? We have so much more in common. And so remembering how to communicate with each other and learning the skills that make us into super communicators, because we all are super communicators at one time or another. That's the thing that lets us really connect. Obviously, I've read parts of your book, like almost all of your book now. And the, one part I found fascinating was there was a, an area of the book where you talk about communicating in different forms and how it's different. Yeah. Which I mean, I'm going to bounce around. Obviously, I have no. No, stuff, please do. But please I think do. this is relevant for this part of the conversation, which and, is. And by the way, thank you for reading the book. That's uh, very nice you're of you. I really appreciate it. We try to always read the book to, when oh, we have guests well, on. Thank sometimes you. I, I mean, I, I, you'd think that'd be like a normal thing, but well, it's right. not. Sometimes right. I find myself like I have a stack of like five or six at the same time because like we we do we batch a lot of these and I'm like reading them. But yeah, but of course. Um, no, and I think we we need to, but. This part of your book where you're talking about like the way I would write a letter is different than the way I would send a text. Exactly. Different than the way I'd send an email. It's different than the way I would have this interaction. And, yeah. so, and I think like maybe in terms of like you asked about what we thought about social breakdown is maybe we haven't fully yet learned how to communicate on social as yes. well and like receive that information because it's so new. Lauren and I are like one of the, la we didn't get a smartphone until we got out of college. I feel like we were the last generation to grow up without this kind of technology when we were kids. Absolutely. In your pocket. I have a 12 year old and a 15 year old. And what's interesting is that this same conversation happened about a hundred years ago when telephones first became popular. There were all these articles that were written that saying, okay, telephones are in people's homes. Now no one's ever going to have a real conversation on telephone because you can't see each other. You're not going to be able to communicate in a real way. <laughs> and what's interesting is at the time they were right. If you read these early transcripts of those early conversations, it was people using telephones like like telegraphs. They would send each other like stock orders or grocery lists, but oh, they whoa. wouldn't they wouldn't have conversations. Now, of course, by the time we're in middle school, we could talk for like seven hours a night, and these were like the most meaningful conversations of our life. He wouldn't get off the phone with me. That's which is a good sign. It's a good sign. Ugh, I'd go to fall asleep on the phone. Go and, ahead. And you, did you guys fall in love over the phone? Was like he fell old. in love. I was indifferent. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's still kind of the case. I was asleep. So at least one of you is a super communicator because you want you won her over. But I, but what's interesting is that different forms of communication have different rules, and we learn to infer them. So when we talk on the phone without realizing it, oftentimes we overemphasize our words. We over, we over enunciate. We'll put more emotion into our voice because we know the person can't see us. So we need to show them what we're feeling through our vocal tones. 
So we've learned how to use, we've learned the rules of telephones. But you're exactly right. When it comes to so many other forms of communication that exist now, you know, I got my first email address when I started college. I like sending people emojis and using that to have a conversation, which is what my kids do. That's like three or four or five years old. And so it's very understandable that we haven't learned some of those rules yet. We haven't internalized them. I would love for you to going off of this, like on a tangent to also talk about when you're texting someone or you're emailing someone and there's a negative energy or a negative connotation. So like I always say, like the word, unfortunately, never start an email off. No one yes. wants to wake up to an email that says, unfortunately. Yeah. So I would love for you to talk about the energy that we use through email and text message that can come off where the person who's receiving it is immediately on the defense. Absolutely. I, another one is actually, that was pretty good, right? <laughs> If you just say it's pretty good, they're going to like it a lot more than like, actually, I thought it was going to be terrible, but it's pretty good. So here's what we know. And, and here's what we can teach our kids about online digital con conversation and communication, because they're going to do it. They're growing up in a world where having these skills are, are essential. The first thing we can teach them is think about how each form of communication is different. Sending an emoji is different from sending a text, is send, different from sending an email, it's different from calling someone. Some kinds of conversations are better in different channels. Like if you need to talk about something serious, you should probably pick up the phone rather than doing it over text. And then observe the rules, respect the rules. So if I send you an email, if I'm talking to you and I'm sarcastic, we can both hear the sarcasm in my voice. But when I send you a sarcastic email, you might not hear that sarcasm. And so we got to think about that. Like, like you, they might think what I'm saying is serious. They might get offended. And the number one thing that we've learned when it comes to digital communication, and there's been study after study that looks at this, is overemphasize politeness, underemphasize sarcasm. That in a conversation, it's negative, that negative energy you're talking about. If just one person starts saying please or thank you, the quality of the conversation will ratchet up almost 50%. It's unbelievable, though, some of the emails that I get that also the long winded ones that are 600 pages. It's like, what? Yeah. it's almost like when a 600 page email comes in, it's like you have no respect for anyone's time. You're right. You could take it. You, you could take a moment and you could you could clarify. Now, now I will say that sometimes. So um, I put my email address out there in the world as Charles at Charles .com, And I respond to every email I get from a reader or a listener and and sometimes someone sends that huge long email and it's just stream of consciousness and you're reading it and you know, you know that they're in pain, right? They're, they're not actually writing for you. They're writing to let this out. And sometimes all they need as a response is to say, I hear you. I see you. I'm sorry you're going through this. I know it will get better. It's just like they want an acknowledgement. They just want to be seen and heard. And honestly, oftentimes when we have conversations, the thing that makes the conversation good. The, the thing that makes us into a super communicator is just proving to the other person that we're listening to. How can we as women make our husbands communicate more effectively? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I'll tell you what's happened in my marriage. Okay. Careful, Charles. Okay. <laughs> so step into the dungeon. <laughs> yes, exactly. So one of the, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I got into this bad pattern with my wife, whom I love and adore. We've been married for 20 years and she's wow. smarter than I am. And Congratulations. She's, She's a better surfer than I am. She's wonderful. I would come home from work and I would like start complaining about my day. And Liz very practically would give me like a suggestion, like, why don't you take your boss out to lunch and you guys can get to know each other a little bit better. And instead of being able to hear her, I would get more upset. And I would say like, why aren't you supporting me? You're supposed to be on my side. And then she would get upset because I was attacking her for giving me good advice. And I wanted to understand why this kept happening because I knew it was a bad pattern, but like, I'm a professional communicator. Why do I slip into this so easily? And so I called up all these neurologists and psychologists and I said, well, I'm going to write a book about it. So will you please tell me how to, how to fix my own problems? And what they said is, well, here's the thing that you're missing. And I think this gets to what happens in a lot of marriages. We think of a conversation as being about one thing, but actually most discussions are made up of different kinds of conversations. Right. And in general, they fall into one of three buckets. There are practical conversations where we're solving problems together. We're making plans. There are emotional conversations where I might tell you how I'm feeling, 
And I don't want you to solve my feelings. I want you to, to empathize. And then there's social conversations about how we relate to each other in society and the social identities that are important to us. And they said, if you're not having the same kind of conversation at the same moment, you're not really talking to each other. So when you came home, you were having an emotional conversation and your wife, Liz, was having a practical conversation and you literally couldn't hear each other. And so here's what we do now. I come home and I complain and Liz says, do you want me to help you figure out how to solve this problem or do you just need to vent and complain? And it feels so good when she asks me, right? I'm Because up until that moment, I haven't stopped to ask myself and I say like, no, 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 this isn't a big deal. I just need to, I just need to vent about it. So I think that one of the things we can do, particularly women, because I think they're particularly talented at this, is to just take a beat and say, what kind of conversation are we having? I asked Michael, are you at request for coaching? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even so sometimes to your point, if I'm in a certain kind of mood and I get that question, I'm going to meet that with some resistance because it feels like in a way you are you like, you Being know, I am your patron. It can feel yeah. patronizing. Yeah. 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 No, and I, and I love how you framed out the three kinds of conversations I actually had a, a, these highlights is, is one of those. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the three types of conversations from your perspective yeah. and, and how people can maybe identify which kind of conversation they're in? And I'll, and I'll tell folks the right way to figure out what kind of conversation you're in, which is probably something that you guys do intuitively with each other, which is, to ask questions, and in particular, to ask a special kind of question known as a deep question. And a deep question can sound kind of intimidating, right? But a deep question is just something that asks me to, to just talk about my values or my beliefs or my experiences. And it can be as simple as you know bumping into someone and saying like, oh, wh what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm an accountant. Oh, do you love being an accountant? What's that like? Like, how did you decide to become an accountant? What made you decide to go to medical school? Those are deep questions and they're not hard to ask. And when the person responds, they usually tell you what kind of conversation, what kind of mindset they're in. So think about the difference. And the same person might answer the question both ways to say, oh, I became an accountant because, you know, I wanted a steady job and I knew that there was always work for accountants. That's that practical. That's practical. That person's a practical mindset. Now think about that same person might say, you know, I just fell in love with numbers like and and like my dad, my dad had an accountant who he relied on and he helped us when we were in some financial distress and I saw how much he could change this person's life. That's an emotional perspective, right? And it might even be social. Like I just, you know, I think that there's that in, in America, we need more people increasing financial literacy. That's social. If we listen, if we ask a deep question, and then we just listen for one of these three conversations, oftentimes people, they tell us where they, where they want to be, what kind of mindset is important to them. Sunbum just launched their new daily collection with three new products to be used on the daily. And the one that I am loving out of all three is the daily body. I recently just traveled and you guys know I'm a sunscreen freak and I wanted something really great for my body. This one is feels like your favorite body lotion, but with SPF. I don't like something thick and sticky that gets everywhere all over my clothes. I wanted something light, like I'm wearing linens and silks and I wanted it to be really sort of like comfortable. So I love that it feels like your favorite body lotion. Like it's just lightweight. You put it on in the morning and you truly forget about it. Sunbum's new sunscreen really thinks it's a moisturizer and that's a good thing. Like I said, it really is ultra lightweight. It has a moisturizing formula with a built-in SPF. So it's easy to stay protected from the sun every day. You can use this when you get out of the shower to put it on your arms, on your hands, on your legs. I even put it on my feet. I'm serious about it. And you should know, and this is important for a sunscreen, that it has 24-hour hydration. It's also SPF 50. It's sheer and invisible. Really, like the whole entire time that I wore it, it was not sticking to my clothes. I just feel like everyone needs a good daily sunscreen, and the daily body is the best. Visit sunbum.com. That's S-U-N-B-U-M.com and use code SKINNY15 at checkout. You get 15% off your first purchase. That's S-U-N-B-U-M dot com code SKINNY15. And you get 15% off your first order. Sunbum dot com code SKINNY15. If you are going to do one thing in your home to upgrade your home, 
my recommendation would be to do all non-toxic cleaning supplies. I cannot tell you how much this has changed my life. I was recently on a trip. I was traveling and the whole time they were using toxic cleaning supplies. And I totally noticed that I was sneezing. I had like a redness on my leg from laying in the detergent. I just didn't feel as good as when I'm at home with non-toxic cleaning supplies. And that's because Branch Basics is free of fragrance, hormone disruptors, and harmful preservatives. There are so many cleaning supplies on the market. You'll notice this too if you travel and you switch over that just make you feel like shit. Branch Basics, though, has you covered. Their premium starter kit replaces all your harmful cleaning supplies in the home. So it's like one swipe. I also love their hand soap. The Branch Basics now has a luxurious gel hand soap. I have it in my kids' bathrooms, so I don't need to worry about them washing their hands with products that disrupt their hormones. Branch Basics is made with only the safest ingredients to nourish your skin. I have switched literally everything in my house to them. I cannot shut up about them. Everything is non-toxic. Amazing. Your home should be a place that you detox. Save 15% on your starter kit or their new hand soap when you use code SKINNY at checkout. That is branchbasics.com. Use code SKINNY. Again, code SKINNY for 15% off when you purchase a starter kit or their new gel hand soap. One of the most savvy supplement companies on the market is Symbiotica. I love their products because they make it so easy to incorporate them into your routine. So what I'll do is I'll put like three of their little packets in my handbag on the go. I like how they're in those like tiny packets and they taste delicious as opposed to like an actual pill. They have this vitamin C that tastes absolutely delicious. It's like creamy and like orangey and so good. My kids love it. And then I love their glutathione. I always take their glutathione when I'm drinking alcohol. We were just on vacation and I had my house stocked with glutathione. All my friends were taking it. And then my other favorite product by them, it's a spray. And basically what I do at night is I spray it on my body. It smells like lavender and it just goes into your skin. It smells absolutely delicious. I'll like even use it sometimes as a perfume because the magnesium just sinks right into your skin. Their supplements are so savvy, and it's a really easy, effective way to get your daily dose of nutrition. Every product is really, really thought out. We have a code for you. I've given my family this code. I use the code. Start your subscription today. Get the vitamin C, the glutathione, and the magnesium spray. You will not be sorry. You can save up to 15% off your subscription with our code SKINNY. Just go to symbiotica.com and use code SKINNY on your subscription order. You can save up to 15% off your subscription with our code SKINNY. Just go to symbiotica.com and use code SKINNY on your subscription order. That's symbiotica.com. I'm wondering if there's a common denominator that you see people doing that they could quickly shift immediately when it comes to communicating. Yeah. So I think there's two things. Um, well, can I ask you guys? Yeah, go for Uh-oh. it. How has your communication changed? How long have you been married? How many years? We've been married since 2016. So eight years. Okay. How has your communication changed over the course of your relationship? We know each other since we were 12. Okay. So, so you've got, you got some... He's respected my boundary. I cannot wake up at eight in the morning and hear 700 things. I need right. to like have a coffee, maybe a workout. And he's backed off in the mornings, what, which is incredibly helpful. What I've realized <laughs> is that being together so long, and honestly, this show has been a little bit of a hack because we get to speak to people that are much smarter than us for a living. Um or at least smarter than me. And um, I've realized that just because you have a certain type of energy or a certain type of communication style doesn't mean you can deploy that all the time the way you want to deploy I that I think all there the time. was an emotional residency happening where he wanted me to take emotional residency wherever he was at. So if he's right. stressed, he wants me to get on the same level of stress. Or if he needs to get something done right away, he wants me to take on that level. And I think he's learned that just because he's ruminating on something doesn't mean I have to then. Or yes. like the other way, like, I, you know, I'm I'm more like turbo in some approaches and maybe she's more lackadaisical in some, but it, it, it's like, we'll take a business perspective. Um, she like wears the more creative hat, but sometimes there's something that is more logistics or practical mm-hmm. working together. Yeah. And before I'd be like, you need to, like, I would be like, you got to do it this way. And now I will frame it as like a question where I'd be like, hey, what do you think would it would look like if we tried this or did that? And I let her kind of see what I'm trying to convey, but without me forcing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And what I hear you guys saying, and tell me if if I'm getting this this right, is that 
you guys communicate differently and you communicate di- about different things sometimes, sure. but that you show each other you're listening. So yes. if he's stressed, you, you can say either directly or indirectly, I see that you're stressed. I hear that you're stressed. I, I, I'm not going to become stressed with you. That might not even be helpful, but I want to acknowledge that I hear what you're saying. You say it a little more eloquently than me, but I'll take <laughs> notes on that. I'm a little bit more a uh, Kurt. <laughs> no, but what I, what I, one of the things I got, but from, I'll take your, I'm going to okay, take your notes. Okay. I mean, I got a lot from reading, but one of the things I, I also got was sometimes we're trying to talk about a specific issue that feels like it's a practical issue, but it actually is much more of an emotional issue. Let's take personal finance. Oh, ab- all the right? time, like, right? I might want to like, you know, maybe that is a hat more that I wear in the house and like probably stems from having a childhood where there was like a scarcity mindset of like, is money not going to be there? And so I want somebody to dive into it. And my conversation is more of a fear of like, hey, why won't you talk about this with me? Yeah. And hers is not. And so what I realized is like even sometimes with like practical communication where a f- couple is fighting, there is an emotional element. Where if, if I stood back to her and said, hey, I'm just a little bit nervous of this because of this, she might receive that differently than me like trying to talk finance with her. Absolutely. The big fights I've ever had with my wife are usually about finances, right? They're usually about money. And my wife is fantastic at money. She's great. She runs, she's a scientist. She runs these big multi-billion or multi-million dollar grants. She is really, really good at money. But when we start talking about money, sometimes, sometimes I fall into that practical mindset where I'm like, look, let's do the budget. Let's figure out, let's figure out why. And really what I'm feeling is something emotional. I'm feeling something like, you know, I'm stressed about this and I don't know how to express the stress or I feel like we're spending too much. And, and, and that, that makes me worry about what's down, down the line. And one of the things that's great about Liz is that she is really good at stepping back and saying, actually, like, this isn't necessarily a conversation about money. This is actually a conversation about how we feel and, and how much control we each have in this relationship and how we appreciate each other. She sounds like a real communicator. She is amazing. She's amazing. And she's really good at, figuring out what we ought to be talking about and bringing us there. So you asked, what is the one thing we can do immediately that helps us? And the number one thing we can do, and Liz does this really well, is we can prove that we're listening. When someone says something to us and it seems like something meaningful, even if we've heard them, when we repeat it back to them and say, am I getting this right? This is what I heard you tell me. Or when we ask a follow-up question, or when we say, look, this is something, you know, I know that this is a hard conversation. I want to thank you for having it. We might even walk away feeling differently about this, but I want you to know, here's what I heard you say, and I appreciate you saying that to me. That changes everything, particularly in a conflict conversation. Listening seems to be a real underrated, like I feel like it's an art and it needs to be talked about more because it's really something that anyone can tap into and get better at. Yeah, yeah. And the great thing about listening is that to get better at it, all we have to do is listen, right? You don't, you don't have to like go run a marathon. You don't have to like learn how to speak a foreign language. You just listen. Now, what's important though, is that when we are listening, the other person might not realize that we're listening. And oftentimes, particularly in a conflict conversation, even with someone we love, if we're disagreeing about something, if we're in a fight, there's a part of our brain that suspects this person isn't listening to me. They're waiting their turn to speak. And so when we prove that we're listening, when we show that we've actually processed what someone has said, we, we ally that anxiety. And there's actually a great technique that they teach at, at Harvard and Stanford and a bunch of fancy places called looping for understanding. It has three steps. Step one, ask a question, preferably a deep question. Step two, repeat back in your own words what you just heard the person say. And then step three, and this is the one we often forget, Ask if you got it right. You know, Charles, it's been great having you on the show. (laughs) Charles, when I am talking sometimes to my husband, this is like therapy. He will, I'll say, did you listen to what I said? Because he'll, he'll like change the subject or whatever, whatever men do. (laughs) I'll just blame it on men. And And he'll say, my brain just processes faster than a normal person. <laughs> no, I, I said, say I, what you no, say. no, I will say I process. I heard her. I will repeat back to her what she said, but I will not 
do the third part. I just realized I don't do the third part. Well, you also be, could repeat it back to me. That's the second part. No, do don't forget the second part. It it's a sandwich. You all the time. It is a sandwich. So we, uh, the next time he says my brain processes faster than the normal you know, person. Part of, part of having you on the show today, I knew, I, again, reading the book, I was like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to come up. I'm going to be a punching bag on this show. But but no, but I do like, listen, jokes aside, I could be better. We all could be better. We all could be better. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you asked about like what we've learned. This show has forced me and taught me to be a better listener. And also I think as an interviewer, many interviewers fall into the trap of waiting to, for the person to stop so they can ask the question. Yes. And, you know, we have notes and stuff, but like what we try to do here and we've had to work, I mean, listen, we've never been perfect and we're still working at it, but we've had to spend a lot of time following the conversation where it actually goes as opposed to like, wait, I got my next question. It doesn't work. You know? That's exactly. And, and what's interesting is that when researchers look at conversations, what they find is exactly what you just said is incredibly powerful. So if you ask someone, oh, you had a long conversation with that person, what'd you talk about? They might be able to remember one or two, maybe even three topics they talked about, but they won't remember exactly what they said. They won't remember what the other person said, not precisely. But if you ask them, how'd you feel during that conversation? They will be able to tell you precisely. We don't remember what someone said to us we remember how they made us feel during a conversation. And the way that we do that is we're in the flow. It doesn't matter if you say something wrong. It doesn't matter if your tongue get tongue tied. If like my, the ideas always sort of have trouble getting from my brain to my lips. But if we're following each other, if we're matching each other, if we're having the same kind of conversation, if I'm proving that I'm listening to you and I'm asking you deep questions, that's what you're going to remember about the conversation. Do you think that the reason that people have sort of lost the art of listening is because social media is so quick and it's like that quick hit that they're used to being just hit with the drug right away? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's definitely part of it. And I think I think part of it too is, so so your kids are too young to have phones, I assume, or or to to use them regularly. Yes, they're too young to have. They're By the not time getting they're old phones enough, we'll be Amish, ever. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so my my kids are twelve and fifteen, and the one thing I will say is, my kids, they use their technology really differently than I do. Like they have whole conversations that are just emojis, and those emojis are emotions, right? They're telling each other like, oh, that made me happy, it made me laugh, or it made me sad. And so our kids are going to be better at this than we are. They are learning how to do it better, better than we did. But to your point, there are aspects of social media that can be destructive because they're not conversations, right? When you're just flipping through video after video after video, you're not actually having a conversation with someone. You're just absorbing. Or if you're on Twitter and you're screaming at each other and you're seeing people all lump on and jump on someone and, and talk about how terrible they are. That's also not a conversation. That's not trying to show that we're listening to each other, that we're understanding. And so the more that we teach our kids and ourselves that like, let's remember what's good about communication, the more that we can use these devices and these new tools to really connect with each other. Can we discuss, you have a, these rules in your book sure. around having I guess, would you call it more productive or better? Or uh, more, a listening, a learning conversation. Learning conversation. Yeah. And I probably screwed this up. I probably in the beginning could have done some of these things to set my goals no. and intentions, but we dove right in and I got too excited. I love but, it. But um, okay. So for the learning conversation, you have rule one here, which looks like we've, we've kind of dove into already, which is pay attention to what kind of conversation is occurring. And it's really easy. You don't even... You can even just be like as basic as like, is this emotional or practical or social? Okay. So, so we, this right now is social. Us three. So what's interesting is in a conversation, you actually, every conversation contains all three elements and you'll move between emotional and okay. social that makes sense. and practical. Like practically, we're talking about this book. And but this emotionally, you'll emotionally, bring up your wife. Yes, exactly. Okay. So okay. we talk about my Got wife it. and that's kind of emotional, but you're asking about th the four rules yeah. and that's kind of practical. Okay. As long as we're matching each other and moving together, as long yep. as we're moving from conversation to conversation together. So if I say, tell me the rules when you're about to cry, having an emotion, that, that's- a, If, I, I'm, if I'm like, you know, I went to my dad's funeral and you're like, I'd like to know what the rules are. 
then it might not have to laugh. Yeah, yeah, it might not <laughs> land yeah. quite as well, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's rule one. Rule two: share your goals, and this is what I was just mentioning, Lauren, and ask the uh, uh, what others are seeking. So, like, if I would have started the conversation and said, "Hey, Charles, so nice to meet you. One of my goals here is to learn how to be a better communicator. One of my goals, selfishly, is also I want you to like me so that you'll come back right. on the show. <laughs> I don't want to be unliked. But like, if I share the attention from the beginning of the conversation, what does that do? Oh, it transforms things, right? Because Part of it is that if we know our own goal, we're a lot more likely to achieve it. Like if, if, if you know, like my goal in this conversation is to become a better communicator, to learn a couple of tips, then you, you are so much, you ask so much better questions, right? Because they're the questions that you want to ask. And if you, if you can elicit from me, like what I want, like, oh, I'd like, like to get to know you guys a little bit better. I, I, I think you're interesting and I want to see how, understand how you see the world then you understand where my questions are coming from. And sometimes we can just say like, what's the agenda for this conversation? Like, you know, we, it's a business meeting. We have an agenda. We know what the goals are, but in casual conversations, it's a little bit different. Right. And sometimes the way that we figure out what people's goals are is that we, we run little experiments. We might tell a joke to see if they laugh back. Is this a casual conversation or is it a formal conversation? You might bring up an idea and I say, oh, that's a great idea. Like, here's, here's, here's another perspective on that. And I'm asking essentially, are you interested in sort of figuring out how to test these ideas and sort of make them bigger? We do this almost naturally, instinctually, but the more that we do it deliberately, the better off we are. And there's this really fascinating study um, that was done by Harvard Business School professors where they told students, okay, look, you're going to have a conversation with a stranger. And this is usually like the most anxiety producing thing you can ask a person to do, right? To go have a conversation with a stranger. But they say, okay, before the conversation, we want you to just take seven to 10 seconds and write down three topics that you want to discuss. And it can be stuff like, you know, have you seen Dune 2? And like, what do you think of this weekend's game? And then, and then take seven or 10 seconds, stick it in your pocket, go have the conversation. So they go and they, they find, they, afterwards they ask everyone, how'd that go? And the topics that those people wrote and stuck in their pocket almost never came up huh. or at least not directly, not in that way. But what they said was that conversation went so much better than I thought it was going to go. Hmm. I felt so much more confident. I saw, felt so much less anxious. I kind of knew what I wanted to talk to them about and they knew what they wanted to talk to me about and it felt so good. And it's because they had this safety net in their pocket because they had forced themselves to think just for seven to 10 seconds what do I hope I'm going to get out of this conversation? That can make all the difference in the world. It's also like you suffer more in your imagination. Yes. And we, and we like create this whole thing. Yes. And when you're actually energetically having the conversation, I think it's more comfortable than when you're thinking about it. But I yeah. imagine even in like a conflict in a relationship, if you started that conversation with like, hey, one of my goals and intentions here is like, like to even pick on the finance thing is like, I'm stressed about this money. One of my goals is to like, have you help me work through this and feel better about it. Absolutely. Or is that how you're going to start a conversation with me? Yeah. <laughs> no, but Because I'm into that. My goal <clears throat> in this conversation is to see if I can get to second base before nine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, okay. So with a two-year-old and four-year-old, good luck. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. all I'm saying. Okay. Got a plan. But, but what's interesting too is that the thing that you just raised that when in a conflict conversation, when we announce our goal, oftentimes when we come in and we're clear about what our goal is, we stop this other pattern from happening, which is known as kitchen sinking. So one of the most dangerous things that can happen in a relationship is that you start arguing about one thing <laughs> and suddenly it becomes a fight about everything, right? We're no, talking I about like, yeah, yeah, we talk like we're, we're talking oh, like in 19. Right, you did this work yeah. and you, and you don't earn enough money and you don't respect me. So this is called kitchen sinking. And it is literally the thing that marriage therapists look for as this, the danger sign. I can kitchen sink sometimes. Yeah, I'll be we all aware. can. We all can do it. Checks mix. You never know what you're going to get. Now, the solution to that is to basically control, control the fight together, to be partners and think about how wonderful it is to start a conversation by saying, Okay, I want us to talk about where we're going to go for Thanksgiving. And I know that's a hard topic. Let's not talk about money. Let's not talk about our mothers. Let's not talk about like what happened in 1982. <laughs> but like, can I, can I ask your permission to focus on this one question? When we do that, it transforms it because suddenly we're partners. We might disagree with each other, but we're partners in controlling the boundaries of this conversation and what we want to get out of it. Kitchen sinking is a really interesting concept. And I think that 
articulating it the way you did is probably very powerful for people listening because we all know and we've all been in these kind of arguments where all of a sudden you think you're talking about one thing and all of a sudden you're in a whole nother world and you weren't prepared for it and somebody's blindsided. But totally. And I, I like, I literally did it last night. I was talking to my wife and she brought something up and I was like, well, yeah, but what about this time that you did that? And I was like, and like, as I, as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, oh, this is, ex I'm doing exactly the wrong thing. What, why do I feel so comfortable communicating via text message when I'm angry? Cause I'm the type that fires like 40 bullets over text and then blocks him. <laughs> <laughs> so the blocking might not be the healthiest thing, right? I would, I would say that we might want to like back in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> but it, actually, I don't know that that's a terrible thing. I know. See? I, I think I would, okay, Charles here, likes it. here's what I'm hearing you say. And you can tell me if I'm getting this wrong. What I hear you say is when you are upset, you know that if you have that fight face to face, if you share what you're feeling face to face, it might make things only worse. It's going to get ugly. So it's I go take ugly. a walk. Yeah. And then I get my phone out. And then, and then you send these texts. And the nice thing about a text is you get a chance to kind of like, you type it out and you're like, yeah, you're a jerk. And then you look at it and you're like, well, let's just like, uh, well, what's the second part that you do? <laughs> I voice note it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But at least you're taking that step. You, are, you know, and my guess, is, and tell me if I'm wrong, my guess is that when you start getting all those voice notes, you're like, Fuck. okay, uh, <laughs> like I'm going to set aside, I'm not going to assume that the first voice note is going to be like the last voice you, note. You asked and, how we've been learned how to communicate as we've gone in marriage. Early days, I would try to respond individually to each one. Now I respond, okay, got it. Let eight more come through. Yes, dear. Hear ya. And then I step back for about an hour and wait. And by the time she comes back, it's like, okay, like we, you know, I like pass the ketchup. I, yeah. I, I think also, and maybe you've experienced this in your own marriage. I think most mature couples have is you get to a point in a relationship where you decide like, is this the hill you like, like meaning like, is this the real serious fight that you want to really have? Or is some, or is this one of those moments where you're like, Hey, we were been a bad mood, bad moment. Yeah. Your mom always Walk says on. that. Is this the like, hill we, you want to die? We, on? we talk about like, we recover fast from something like, we have two young kids under four. We're sleep deprived. It's We're sick. hard. They bring the plague home every other week. It seems. Yeah. And we just look at each other sometimes. And like, I would just be like, listen, don't know what I said. Don't know what I do, but like, I'm deprived. I'm tired. Like I'm exhausted. Like didn't, you know, move on. Didn't mean it. Like, so sorry. you like the text message. I think it's great. I think like, like, I don't think it, I don't know that there is no one more form of communication that's right for the entire world. But I th what I hear you guys saying is we pay attention to how we talk to each other. And we know that we can't have perfectly rational, ca calm conversations all the time because we're human, because humans want to express things. We but wh what we have learned is how to do that in ways that don't become destructive, but rather allow us to, to find a pressure relief, to, to allow us to send my husband 40 voicemails and have him write back, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Prove that he's listening to you. He's glad it's not a message in a bottle and I decide to go to some foreign <laughs> island and run away with the bartender. Yeah. No, I think, but like whatever, I, I guess also as I've matured and realized that not all of us are perfect and we're all going to have these moments of frustration or weakness. It's like, if that is your venting process and we can then recover after, and it's like, I don't have to rub that venting process in her face, right? Like I'm not going to turn around and be like, look what you did in this moment. And like, really like, I mean, I could, but I, I just, it's not productive. And so yeah. I try to be like, okay, like we all have. Sometimes I just moments. take your phone when you're in the bathroom and delete the text yeah, when I feel delete, stupid. Just delete them all. Okay. Yeah, and I have to say, so I was, I was on another podcast and I was talking about money and, and my, my wife and our relationship. And, and, and I implied something that, that she's not good at money, which is not right. Um, or that, or that we have a difference on money. And, and it really hurt her, right? She heard it and, and it hurt her. And I, I feel so bad about it. And I've apologized and I've said like, look, I'm sorry. Like in the, in the flow of the moment, I said this thing that I, I said it wrong and I didn't say what I was feeling. And so much of communication is understanding that and giving grace to other people, understanding it's just hard. It's hard to communicate, right? And the more that we allow the other person to screw up as I screwed up when I had, when I said this thing and I've apologized so much, the more that we say, look, I understand it is hard to talk. It is hard to get those ideas from your brain to your lips 
without something screwing up, the more that we empower them to actually share with us who they really are. I think saying sorry to in any case where you are sorry should be like that should be normalized more like people like want to die on the hill. Like if you do something wrong, say sorry, take accountability. Honestly, when you're saying sorry, what you're also saying is I hear you. Yeah. Right. I'm proving that I'm lis- that I'm listening to you. I heard you say that I hurt you. And I, at the time that didn't even occur to me, but I'm sorry. Like I hear that you told me that you were hurt and I, I wish that I had done things differently. I'm to your point though, back to you. it's why <laughs> when you're I, sleeping subliminal messages, I really don't like the state of most, you know, politics and, and not to go political, but it's into in mainstream news outlets because to your point, communication is very hard. We do this in a very long format so that if there's something I don't understand or is not articulated correctly, or if somebody makes a mistake, we have time to be like, Oh, what did that really mean? And then I, and even if you, maybe you said something and it was like, Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Can I clear it? Like, we live in an environment where people pull sound bites yeah. and are trying to pigeonhole people to say the wrong thing quickly so that they can then prove their point or pull another sound bite. And that's how a lot of us are getting our information and then passing judgment. And I think it's a, it's a really dangerous place to be in because we're not really listening. We're just waiting for people to screw up and then attacking them and not even taking the time to figure out like, wait, what point were they actually trying to articulate and that's what did exactly, they actually mean? I think that's really well put. And, and, and one of the questions that this raises is like, what is the goal of a conversation, right? And what we know is that the goal of a conversation is just one thing. It is not to convince you I'm right and you're wrong. It is not to, it is not to get you to like me. It is not to impress you with how smart I am. The goal of a conversation is to understand what you are st- trying to tell me and to speak in a way that you can understand me. And if we do that, we have succeeded. We might walk away thinking like that person's completely wrong. I don't agree with them, but I understand them and they understood me. And the nice thing about that is it lowers the expectations, lowers the temperature, lowers what you have to demand of yourself so much. When you go into a conversation with your crazy uncle Jimmy about politics or, you know, you're having a fight that, you know, is you have to, you're got to talk about this hard thing. And it usually becomes a fight. When you go into that saying, I don't have to convince them that I'm right. I don't even have to agree with them. All I have to do is understand what they are trying to tell me and help them understand me. And it's a success. That's so much easier. I also think that when you're talking to someone that's committed to being right, I always look at it as someone, I, I look at them as a child. And I'm like, there's something in their identity as a child where they felt to get attention, they had to be right. Yeah. And so when I'm talking to someone who has to be right, I just like, just let them be right. That's what they need out of the conversation. So just let them hold space for them to be right instead of being combative because I, and you could tell me more, like what are the turnoffs in conversation? I would think con- conflict and being combative is one. So it's interesting. So, cause there's a difference between what, there's a difference between conflict and being combative. Okay. So you're exactly right. Trying to make someone feel small, making this conversation less safe, making them feel like if they say something, I will use it against them. That's disastrous. But conflict can be very different, right? We can sit down and we can say, oh, you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican or I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat. or We feel differently about all these issues or we just, whether Star Trek or Star Wars is better. Star Wars, what? go on. Yeah, I, I totally agree. <laughs> but that being said, we can have that conversation And we can engage in that conflict, discuss that conflict without being combative. And the way that we do that is that we prove that we're listening to each other and we ask each other questions, right? We, this is the thing that super communicators do. There's a bunch of different things. There's asking deep questions, looping for understanding, um, you know, often acknowledging differences rather than pretending they don't exist. But all of these things, all of what they serve is this basic thing, showing you that I want to connect with you showing you that I want to have a conversation with you and I want to understand who you are. And I hope that you want to understand who I am. When we say that to someone, when we show that to someone, then even if they disagree with us about Star Wars or Star Trek or politics, then we, we have a connection. Yeah. I agree with 
everything there except for the Star Trek people. <laughs> <laughs> so Spock's that, gonna come get you in the night, man. <laughs> that kind of goes into your rule three, which is ask about other feelings and sharing your own. Yes. Right? And that is a critical component. And it's critical. The second part of that is ask about other people's feelings and then share your own. Your own. There's this thing known as um, emotional reciprocity or vulnerable or authentic reciprocity of authenticity. If I say something real and meaningful to you, if I share something about myself with you and you just go, oh, interesting. That's, I'm glad you shared that with me. We're not going to feel close to each other, right? But it's an opportunity for you to possibly share something about yourself or at least show that you were listening. A good example of this is, um, so I mentioned my father's funeral. So seven years ago, my, my father passed away and I went to his funeral and this was like, the biggest, right. This was all I was thinking about for months. And I came back from, from the, the funeral and I, I went back to work and, and I would mention to people, they were like, where were you last week? I was, my dad passed away and they would say something like, Oh, I'm sorry, my condolences. And then they would just move on. Like we'd talk about whatever else we normally talk about. And if somebody had said to me, had said, Oh, really? I'm so sorry to hear that. Like, what was your dad like? It would have been amazing. It's all I wanted to talk about. I would have been thinking about what he was like for, for weeks, but we don't do that because we we're worried that we're going to say the wrong thing. We're worried that it's going to be uncomfortable. We're worried that we don't know what to say next. Specifically with death, huh? Yeah. Spe- most importantly with death. But when we invite someone, sometimes the way that we say something emotional about ourselves is simply by asking a question that says, I, I, I have been through this. I know what this is like. I know that you've, you're thinking about your dad all the time right now. Tell me about him. So part of emotional connection is not only asking about other people's emotions, it's also sharing how we're feeling, sharing who we are, not stealing the spotlight, not saying like, oh, your dad passed away. I totally understand. My aunt passed away seven years ago. And like, oh, that's you know, the worst. right. Like that's not, that's not a conversation. That's, that's trying to get the spotlight for yourself. But when we're authentic and we're genuine and we share I'm sorry your dad passed away. My dad passed away. I know how hard this is. What was he like? That feels amazing. Really good advice about what to say if someone passes away. That's some of the best advice I've ever heard. Yeah. Well, let me know how it goes. <laughs> I, I will, I'm going to steal uh, so many of these, these <laughs> tips for you. I think that it would be horrible to have you here and not talk a little bit about habit. Of course. Of course. Absolutely. I would I mean, love to. The audience. For like, those that are not familiar, I think you have You've also written probably one of the most prominent and prolific books on habits in the power of habit in the history of books on habits, right? Oh, that's so kind of you guys to say. Now I and and I love hearing from people about habits and and talking about habits. Well, habits is like my favorite thing ever to talk about in the world. Yeah. It's my favorite. So I guess my first question about habits is how do you make a habit quickly and efficiently and and make it effective? Okay. So the thing to understand is that every habit has these three components, right? There's a cue. And, and this, is, this is, comes from a part of our brain known as the basal ganglia. Every animal on earth has a basal ganglia and it exists literally to make habits. Because if you can't make habits, you can't evolve. What it does is it takes a cue, a trigger, and it links it to a routine, a behavior. And then it notices if there's a reward. Every habit in your life, and 40 to 45% of what you do every day is a habit. Every habit in your life delivers a reward to you, whether you're aware of it or not. When you back the car out of the driveway without like hitting the garbage can on the way out and you make it into the street almost by habit, you're like also thinking about the meeting you got that day. There is a little reward sensation in your brain that occurs when you make it out into the street and you don't hit the garbage can. You're not aware of that. You don't notice it, but your brain does. And so your brain says, okay, I'm going to make, the basal ganglia says, I'm going to make this cue, this routine, and this reward into a habit loop. And I'm going to make it easier and easier and more and more automatic to do this thing. So if you want to create a habit in your life, don't focus on the behavior. Focus on the cue and the reward. Find a stable cue that you can give yourself. Like, what's a habit you'd like to create? What's a habit I'd like to create? Um, Maybe waking up a little bit more early. Okay. Okay. So let's figure out a cue for that. And most cues fall into one to five buckets. There's time of day. There's a, uh, a um, particular place. There's a certain emotion. There's the presence of other people. Or there's a preceding behavior that has become ritualized. 
Oh my God. And you can, you get, you get to choose. It's up to you. So for you, maybe it's a time. If it's, I think, I think it's going to be like a time of day, right? Cause you want to wake up a little bit earlier. I want to wake up a little bit earlier. Okay. So we're going to set an alarm for that, for when you wake up. Okay. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Okay. That's hard. It's hard. It's hard, but we're going to, we're about to make it better. Okay. So time of day, I'm going to wake up at, at 550 rather than 615. 630 instead of seven. Okay. Love it. Love it. (laughs) 630. You're, you're a woman after my own heart. (laughs) So I'm going to wake up at 630 rather than seven. I'm going to set the alarm for 630. That's my cue. Now, what's the routine? What do you, you wake up. What do you want to do to avoid going back to sleep? Meditate. Meditate. Okay. Yeah. So you got to get out of bed. Yeah. You got to go over and and sort of get into the meditation position. You're not going to meditate, hopefully, under the covers. My baby, don't mean to brag, sleeps from 7.30 to 7.30. And I have hacks for you. The first thing I do is there's no lights in his room. Okay. It's completely dark. That's really important. And then I play like a white noise machine. But instead of the white noise, I use the like cackling fire. And then the other thing I use that has changed my life is Dreamland Baby's Lightly Weighted Sleep Sack. First of all, when I pull this out, he associates this with sleep. So immediately he knows it's time to go to bed. So he's like, okay, it's time to wind down. I put it on. It's lightly weighted. So it immediately relaxes him. It eliminates anxiety. And when I put him in the crib, because it's lightly weighted and kind of like a cocoon, he goes right to sleep and he stays asleep. And this is the product that I recommend to all new moms when they tell me their baby isn't sleeping through the night. It's absolutely changed my life. I love my sleep and I want my baby to love the sleep. The Dreamland Baby Lightly Weighted Sleep Sack gives your baby a deeper sleep, a better sleep. It's easy to use. It's quality material. I really like the colors too. There's like a neutral one and a black one. Towns uses both. And we really just cannot live without it. I'm telling you, it's the move, okay? Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and enter our code SKINNY at checkout to receive 20% off site-wide plus free shipping. This offer is for new and existing customers. That's dreamlandbabyco.com, code SKINNY. And I would get this for every new mom. Great baby shower gift. I am very proud of the way that I've rehabilitated my hair. It's been a journey, let me tell you. So my problem wasn't necessarily like hair thinning. It was more shedding. So every time I got out of the shower, I would notice on my silk pillowcase that there was hair shedding. So I did a couple things. I started doing scalp massage daily. I got like a micro needler to go over my scalp. I started eating a lot of meat for the aminos. And then I implemented a supplement. And that supplement is the best one on the market. I know because I have tried a lot of different products and this one is by far the best. Nutrafol, it's the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement. With over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding, I've noticed so much less shedding. I cannot even tell you my hair has never been thicker. I'm not even wearing extensions, which is wild because I've always worn extensions. Your hair is never just about your hair and Nutrafol knows that. That's why Nutrafol takes a whole body approach to hair health. They address the problems inside to help hair grow on the outside, supporting your lifestyle, not just your hairstyle. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month's subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter promo code SKINNYHAIR. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code SKINNYHAIR. That's Nutrafol.com, promo code SKINNYHAIR. Quick break to talk about one of my favorite partners to talk about. And that's because every single time I talk about it, I feel like I'm putting some good out into the world, getting some good karma. That is with the farmer's dog. If you are not taking care of your dog with the most nutritious, delicious food, what are you doing? We spend so much time thinking about how we take care of ourselves, what we put on our body, and not nearly enough time thinking about what we feed our most precious pets. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Farmer's Dog, the Farmer's Dog makes and delivers fresh, healthy food right to your door. It's developed by vets, nutritionally balanced, and made from real meat and veggies to the safety standards of human food. It's the best option for dogs of all life stages because it's not kibble, it's not canned goo, it's just real, healthy food. 
Lauren and I switched our dog's food to the farmer's dog a few years back, and we've noticed immense changes. Their coats are better. They're happier. They're just thriving. And that's because traditional dry and wet dog food options are highly processed, can use much lower quality ingredients they claim to, and are extremely difficult to portion accurately. The farmer's dog isn't just fresh, higher quality food. They also send the food pre-portioned specifically for your dog based on the unique nutritional needs. This makes it easy to help your dog maintain their ideal weight, which is one of the biggest indicators of a full, healthy life. And it doesn't matter if your dog is young or old, it's always the right time to begin investing in their health. That means more happy, healthy, and full years together. And as always, we have an incredible offer from The Farmer's Dog. Get 50% off your first box of fresh, healthy food at thefarmersdog.com slash skinny. Plus you get free shipping. Just go to thefarmersdog.com slash skinny to get 50% off. That's thefarmersdog.com slash skinny. That's I it's... meditate under the covers, you... Charles. Okay. Listen, but I, here's what I Charles, do. I put my legs up on the wall to drain my Charles, legs to get my nervous she system. She is on her high horse saying she meditated for 45 minutes, but I think sometimes I hear in there snoring. <laughs> no, so I about. meditated this morning for 45 minutes. Yeah, but you were I had the... my legs up on the wall. The only problem is I tr- it starts at 7 and sometimes my daughter wakes up at 7.30. Yeah, it's okay. kind of like when I'm so watching Shogun at night. Time. I'm actually yeah. just, I'm studying. I'm not so, actually just watching Shogun. So, okay, right. <laughs> so, okay, so... So the routine for you, the behavior is you're going to put your legs up on the wall. Yes. That means you're ready for meditation. Yes. Then you're going to meditate. When you are done meditating, you need to give yourself a reward and you need to let yourself enjoy that reward. Okay. And that reward can be taking a nice long shower. It can be going and having a smoothie. It can be taking a couple of minutes and thinking like, you know what? I just feel really good and proud about myself. Like I'm going to let myself enjoy that I just meditated and I did a good job of it. It could be eating a small piece of chocolate. You need to give yourself a reward because what's going to happen is that basal ganglia, it's going to notice that reward and the reward has to come right away. And it's going to say, oh, tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off, I'm going to make it a little bit easier to put my legs up on the wall because I know at the end of it, I'm going to get that piece of chocolate or I'm going to get that smoothie or I'm going to get that self sense of self-congratulation. I think the reward is to dry brush and then get in a freezing cold shower, which sounds weird because people are like, oh, that's free. But like the freezing cold shower with dry brushing gives me so much energy. Yeah. That I that is that a reward? I mean, do you enjoy it? Yeah. Do you look forward to it? Yeah. Then it's a reward okay. for you. Okay. I, I don't think it'd be a reward for me, <laughs> but but for you, it's clearly a reward. OK. And what's important is that each day you're not going to notice this. Our brains turn off when we're in the grip of a habit. Each day is going to get easier. So you just start doing it. You just start doing it. You're going to start doing it automatically. And at some point, you're not even going to think about it. You're going to, the alarm's not going to go off. The power outage, daylight savings. And you're going to wake up at 6.30 and you're going to put your legs up on the wall. And then you're going to think like, I can't wait to get that leg that 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 cold shower that makes sense because that's how i got myself to get in bed earlier is i have this like magnesium drink that i like yeah. and i like to read my kindle and so getting in bed earlier means i get to do those two things exactly that makes total sense now now the thing is think about how often we do this which is you mentioned that your daughter wakes up so you wake up at you wake up you put your legs up on the wall and then your daughter starts crying and you're a little stressed right Or let's say, I say tomorrow morning, I'm going to go for a run and I go out and I run around the block and I come back and, and now I'm sweaty and now like I'm behind schedule. So I have to like rush through my shower and I got to get the kids ready for school. I got to drive to work. Sometimes we create systems that punish us for doing the habit and our brain notices those punishments. It notices if I wake up, like if I wake up and I try and meditate and my daughter cries, I get really stressed about it. I don't want to, I don't want to make it easy to wake up and meditate. Like that's, that's a bad idea. So we have to, we have to not only plan on the reward, we have to cre- create an environment where we can enjoy that reward, which maybe means you don't wake up early every single day. You only wake up on days when your husband is taking care of your daughter or when you know that you have enough time to do that. It's so interesting. You mentioned this because in the morning, most of the time I'm doing the stuff in the morning and trying to get her to the time to do it. But I personally also been trying to get up early and like do the meditation. It's one of the, it's one of the things I'm working on, but I've noticed sometimes I will be in the routine, but since I'm also on kid duty, if they happen to get up earlier, get crazy, it disrupts that whole thing. And then what it's done is it's created what exactly what you're talking about, but I've never thought about it that way. It's like, I'm in the middle of the meditation, kids come down or start screaming and it rips me out of it. And it's like created a negative. It's a punishment. It's you're punishing yourself for that activity. Now, that happens. That yeah, is part of life, do. right? Nope. And the thing to recognize is just to say, this is not a punishment for the meditation. This is life. 
Because oftentimes, simply this deciding is life something, me. yeah, <laughs> so, right. Simply deciding something is a reward actually makes it more rewarding, and deciding something that is not a punishment makes it less punishing. Because in a perfect world, the way I would do it is I would get up. We have this red light, and I do that to like wait. You know, it's, it's good for my eyes, so I'm using that. And then I will do the breath work and meditation, and then I reward myself with like this great coffee. Yeah. But I won't do it until after that. But if that gets all derailed, then it kind of screws up the whole process. So I've like, it's, it's interesting you articulate that because now I'm going to think about this whole process differently. A, a lot of habit is just about how we design our life to make those habits sort of flourish. How have you seen healthy <clears throat> habits out of your writing? Like what have you seen from your audience and from yourself? Oh my gosh. So in, in the power of habit, the, actually this is, the the number one thing that I hear, um, there's a chapter in the Power of Habit about AA and about being in recovery. And in many ways, what AA is is it's a habit change device. It helps us take a, a dysfunctional habit where we've associated drinking with certain kinds of rewards, right? Relaxation and sociability, and it helps us find a new way to access those same rewards by going to a meeting and and spending time talking about things that matter to us. And the emails that I get from people who say things like, I, I, I felt powerless to stop my drinking for decades. And then I read the book and I went to my first AA meeting and I've been sober for 18 months. Those are amazing. Because, because the truth of the matter is we all have something. We all have something that we feel like we don't have control over, right? I wish I exercised more. I wish I ate less. I wish that I wish I was kinder to my kids. And, and what they're really saying is we can change. And this is what we know from the science. We can change any habit. We can create any habit. Your work, I imagine, is incredibly fulfilling for you. Um, that is very nice of you to say. I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, if you talk to my wife, she would say all he does is complain all the time about how hard it is. Cause it's on your next <laughs> book, write about complaining. I love it. That's I the love topic. it. I definitely complaining. will. Before going back to this, to the super communicators book, I think there's a lot of people that would maybe look at this book and potentially look at it as an opportunity to maybe take advantage of people in certain conversations, especially yeah. like you mostly, I tell, you, you write for a lot of business. I, I write for the New Yorker and I write about business topics. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine there's a lot of business people like, Ooh, I can get this. And one of the things I've heard you talk about is negotiation and how sometimes people don't realize that negotiation, it's not actually about winning. It's about like understanding and empathy and getting to a place where you both feel like there's something that's productive happening, right? And, and really understanding so the person. Oh. And, and I, I'd like for you to talk about that a little yeah. bit in communication because I think it's important. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you talk to really elite no negotiators, they don't talk about trying to get the biggest slice of pie. They, try, they talk about trying to figure out ways to make the pie larger. Because if you can find a win-win solution, like everyone's better off, that's the easiest negotiation on earth. But oftentimes to find a win-win solution, I can't go into that saying, I want to win, here's what I, here's what I want to get. I need to understand what you want. And I need to help you understand what I want. Because there's probably some things that overlap where we can come to an agreement and we can say, actually, we can't give you a, a, a salary increase. But what I hear you saying is your employees actually just want more time. Like they see, they, they see time as money. What if I gave them more time? Like what if we had an extra week of vacation? That's how we make the pie bigger. And what's really, really important is that when we are having those conversations, when we're going into that discussion, we need to know what we want. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes, I think sometimes people just want to win. Yeah. And like, that's totally natural. And I know you said that you shouldn't, you, like, you shouldn't go into it, but there are people that just want to win. That's a totally natural instinct. And yeah. by the way, this happens all the time, particularly in marriages, right? So there was a bunch of researchers who looked at what, this is where kitchen sinking came from. There are some couples that can fight and it has no impact whatsoever on the marriage. They're just as happy in the marriage. And then there's some couples who fight and it becomes toxic. It becomes dangerous because every couple fights, right? Every single couple fights. So they were trying to figure out what's the difference between the good fighting and the bad fighting. And they looked at all kinds of things. They looked at like, maybe people are fighting about different topics. Nope. Everyone fights about the same basic stuff, like money, kids. That's, that's what they fight about. Maybe they're, 
maybe some people are, are better at, at compromise and some people just want to win more. Turns out the evidence shows that's not actually true. That there's basically a, we all kind of want to win and we all are pretty good at compromise. The difference between the good fighters and the bad fighters was control. Everyone, when you are in a disagreement, when you're having a fight with someone, when you're having some conflict, everyone has an impulse for control because we get into fight or flight, right? It's a, we're, so we f- we're desperate to find something to control. And the easiest thing to control is the other person. And so we do things like we say, oh, that bothered you? That shouldn't have bothered you. Like, that's not that big a deal. I try and control your emotions. Or we say things like, look, I'm going to talk about this for five minutes and then I'm going to walk away. We try and control their time. That is toxic. It is toxic to try and control another person because they will rebel. And that's that person who just wants to be right. What they're trying to do is they're trying to control you. They're trying to force you to agree with them. So what's the right way to fight? The right way to fight is not to say we don't want to control something because this is an impulse we all, all have. The right way to fight is to say, what can we control together? And I heard you guys actually say this before. Sometimes we control the environment. We start fighting at two o'clock in the morning and we're like, look, we're both exhausted. Like, let's go to bed. Let's get a good night's sleep. Let's pick this up again at 10 a.m., right? So that, we, so that we're not so, so together we're controlling the environment. Sometimes we're controlling the boundaries of the fight. We're saying, it, look, let's just, let's just talk about Thanksgiving. Let's not talk about like my mom and your mom and money. And we can talk about that later, but like, let's just focus on Thanksgiving. We're together controlling the boundaries, the, bear, the, the edges of the fight. Sometimes it's just controlling ourselves. I have a hack if someone wants to control yeah? their environment. What's that? If your husband's fighting, just put mouth tape on. <laughs> I tape my mouth shut when he annoys me and I can't talk. Or just slap it on him if you want. That is fascinating. And can I ask, how does that, when she does that? It's, he can, he can, there's nothing, he can talk all he wants. I can't respond. I do it all the time. If well, he's, is that controlling him? Yeah, I think, Lauren, I think there's some toxic behavior there. Going <laughs> like, well, well I, I will say, actually, in that case, you're controlling yourself. You could put the mouth tape on him and he would hate that. And I'm controlling him. So I do it on myself. I control myself. I think the the Charles biggest doesn't think it's that toxic. I, I think the biggest thing though in a marriage specifically where it gets particularly toxic is that you know that person so well and everything that makes them tick and like their family background and their parents. You and know their, the buttons to push. And yeah, it's like for me to get a rise out of you, maybe I would have to search around and try to figure it out. For me to get a rise out of her, if I was really intentional and wanted to say some really harmful things that I know, like it would, it would take not, maybe half a second. Yeah, because I know because Three quarters she, of yeah, a second. And same with her, and same with Ooh, me. That's you know, good to file and, and in I, my files. This is good to know. But, this is good for just, my data. But I just think it's it's relevant and important for couples to be aware of because people that forget that can potentially like really hurt their significant other easily because you have all, it's like, it's like you're stacked the deck, right? Like you, you know exactly what to do. Yeah. And we do it because when we feel hurt, we want to, we want to hurt back. Yeah. We want to, we, when we feel hurt, we feel that like anxiety, we want to control something and we want to, the most obvious thing is to control the other person. So we, we punch back, right. Mm -hmm. To, we try and punch them to like control whether they're coming at us or not. There is something else that in marriages is really, really important that the good couples do, the couples that stay together no matter how much they fight. Because again, we all basically fight the same amount, to be honest with you. It's just whether those fights get out of control or not. What really good couples do is they match each other. They match the kind of conversation they're having. So we're in a fight. If I tell a joke, you might not feel like laughing, but you're like, (laughs) okay, I hear what you're saying, right? Good couples are almost constantly showing that they're matching each other. And oftentimes, if you ask them, like, did you, like, did you agree with him? They'll say things like, no, no, I don't agree at all. I think he's kind of an idiot on this topic. But then you watch them and they're playing off each other, even though they disagree. That matching, that figuring out what kind of conversation is happening and then in joining someone or inviting them to join you, that makes all the difference. Hope you're taking notes in your trapper got, keeper. Listen, I got all the, I got the notes clearly in the book. Charles, you're welcome to come back on the show. I know you're going to oh, write another book. You. That's absolutely amazing. You can come back anytime. I find you fascinating. I think this was like fucking marriage therapy for me and Michael. Okay. No. Can I, can I ask for a no, favor for sure. then? Yes, yes. Of course. Okay. So I'm curious. Hey, okay. 
a month from now, a week from now, whenever. The next time you guys you guys have a, a fight. Should we Instagram live it? You won't need a month. You won't need a month. <laughs> Just send me an email. Send me an email. Tell me. I will. Tell yeah. me this is what happened. This is how it could have gone bad. And this is how it got better. Tell me what you learn so about. Tomorrow morning when he tries to talk to me before 10 a.m., I'll see how he responds and if he matches my energy and then I'll send you an email. Although not, you will have already, you know, you woke up early and you meditated. You're going to be like in the Zen state I'm not already. saying this to Yank I might need chain. to wake up earlier. I told Lauren when I got this book from you and when I saw you writing this, I said, this is maybe one of the most important books that you can read for like he all did. of them. Thank you. And, and I'm not saying just saying us for what we do. I'm saying any human being because who doesn't want to learn how to communicate in a more effective way, better, listen more. And I just think like the world needs more of it. Yes. And again, going back to the intention of this show, honestly, like we try to be a conduit to serve our audience in a way to get them to question themselves and think deeper and understand and more importantly, like deploy a little more empathy. Yeah. It's funny, like we'll have someone that is maybe fully to the left on the show and about half the audience will lose their shit. And you have someone that's fully to the right and half the audience. And I'm like, there is something there in the middle where if like that's the reaction you're having, it's likely because you're you're not quite listening carefully enough and you're not deploying enough empathy to understand like why does somebody it doesn't mean you have to yeah. agree you don't have to agree but you should understand like should. why somebody because nobody comes out just like oh i'm you know this or that you and know? understanding feels good right we For like sure. we want to be friends with our neighbor just regardless of the political so lawn sign that they have in front of their house we want to be able to talk to crazy uncle gary even though he believes that lizard people are taking over the world we want to connect I am going to be a super communicator. Watch out. Charles, thank you for coming on the show. Where can everyone buy your books? Find you, pimp yourself out. Oh, a, a, anywhere you buy books, uh, Amazon, Audible, Barnes & Noble, your local bookstore, that's the best place to go to, to buy the book. And um, and you can find me. So if you just Google my name, Charles Duhigg, I'll come up or The Power of Habit or Super Communicator is my, but most importantly, my email address is charles at charlesduhigg.com. And if you email me, I will read and reply to your email. Wow. I, I take it seriously that I, if you want to connect with me, I, I feel like I should honor that. That's a full-time job. What's your Instagram handle? My Instagram handle is C Duhig, I think. Okay. All right. I'm I love not, it. I'm not such an IG or not, not the big IG. -er. You yeah. guys, I highly recommend <laughs> going to buy this book. I think this is what, like Michael said, something everyone needs and definitely also check out the power of habit. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank, Thank you, you for having me. the best. That was awesome.